And as you think about names, I mean, they're they're either fun and, and kind of in terms of endearment, or you think back and you're like, I didn't want to be called that ever. I, I was called math for a while as a kid. That 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 felt awful. Um, as a teenager, I don't know if you knew this about me, but I would shave my head every basketball season. One year I used Nair, and I got it like the, the, the white Michael Jordan, and I got so smooth, it was even smoother than Scotty's. It was a thing of beauty. Um, and, and as a result, through middle school and into high school, I was called cue ball. And so I, I, can, I can tolerate that one. That one was okay. But as you think about names, names are something that we really... We, we either adopt or are forced upon us, but it has a lot of significance, what you are called, and the name that you have. Uh, it's some, some people say that the most important word to any of us is our own name. And so it's an important thing. And as we think about the Messiah, we talked about the last two weeks, uh, Jesus and the Messiah. And the names that we gave him last week were kind of impressive names. It was the prophet. It was the priest. It was the king of kings. Like, these are... Like titles that were like, yeah, we can get behind this Messiah guy. He's, he's somebody that's going somewhere. And yet, we must remember that Jesus, as the Messiah, has many names. You look through the New Testament and even into the Old Testament, and the Messiah is given a lot of different titles. And as you go through these different names, some of those names kind of give you a little bit different of emotions inside. And so as we look at Isaiah chapter 52, and we're going to go into Isaiah 53, what we're going to wind up finding is that there's a title that many would look at and say, I don't really like that title of the Messiah. I'm okay with prophet or king, but I don't like this title that's, that's here in Isaiah 52. And some people, in fact, will look at Isaiah 52 and 53 and say, we're not even talking about the Messiah anymore. We're talking about the nation of Israel. Or some people would even go as far and say, we're just going to leave these couple of chapters out of the Bible because we don't like what it has to say. In fact, many Jewish people and, Jew and people in, in Judaism, the religion of Judaism, would look at these chapters with some difficulty. And so I would just want to start off, we're not going to read all these, but I want to at least give these as references, is that there are people within the, the Jewish religion that would look at Isaiah chapter 52 and chapter 53, and they would say, okay, these two chapters are referring to the Messiah. They're not referring to Israel. They're not referring to, to some random group. This is referring to the Messiah. You've got the Babylonian Talmud that, that refers to the Messiah. And it says, Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God, and it's like that. That's all a quote from Isaiah 53 that we're going to get into today. But that is a part of what the teaching of traditional rabbis, some of the traditional rabbis would look at and say, Isaiah 53 is referring to the Messiah. Alex, we're going to go really, really quick, uh, quick through some of these slides. Uh, again, another example of Midrash. Uh, Ruth Rabbah uh, says the same thing, where there's this Messiah, it's referring to the Messiah in Isaiah 52, 53. The next one, Targum, uh, Jonathan, Behold, my servant Messiah shall prosper, he shall be high and increase and be exceedingly strong. Another quote from Isaiah 53. Uh, the Zohar, uh, again, he was wounded for our transgression. All these teaching, all these rabbis, all these uh, kind of scholars within Jewish tradition and Jewish religion look back at Isaiah 53 and say, okay, what we're going to be talking about here is in reference to the Messiah. And if you go back two weeks, the whole point of this one was to prove, hey, Jesus, the Messiah, the Old Testament, it's all converging. Jesus is this person that we're talking about. One more, the, the rabbi, uh, Moses, uh, says, what is the manner of the, the Messiah's advent? They shall rise up, one of whom none has known before, and signs and wonders which they shall See, performed by him will be the proofs of his true origin for the Almighty, where he declares to us his mind upon the matter. says, Behold a man whose name is a branch, and he shall branch forth out of his place. And Isaiah speaks similarly of the time when he shall appear without farther or further or father or mother or family being known. He came up as a sucker before him and as a root out of dry earth, etc. And again, he's referencing back to Isaiah 53. Again, the only reason that I'm going to this stuff is because some people will look at the passage that we're about to look at and say, here's this name of the Messiah, I don't like it, we're going to redirect and talk about something else. And so we have to understand that when we talk about the whole scope of eternity here, what we have to understand is, yes, he's the Messiah, yes, he's the king, yes, he's the prophet, yes, he's the priest, but the title that we see here in Isaiah 53 is not as fun 
It's not as and not as kind of happy and joyful, but it's just as necessary. Just as necessary. Some of the names that we've been called are some that we don't want to have stick, but some of the things that are said to us, some of them are true. Sometimes when, when my wife corrects me and says, hey, this is something that you're doing wrong, I have to swallow it and say, okay, I'm actually doing that. And so what we have to understand about the Messiah is that there is a title here that, again, we might step back from at first, but realize, you know, this is actually accurate about who he is. So Isaiah 52, 53, uh, what we're seeing at the very beginning as this title, and, and here's the title that we're going to see throughout this chapter, is that he is the suffering servant. The suffering servant. King of kings, Lord of lords, eternal priest, great prophet, but he is also a suffering servant. Those don't seem like they should mix, but they do, and we're going to see how here today. Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 15, starts off, and it says, before we get into the suffering servant thing, we have to understand the Messiah will be successful. The Messiah will be successful. At whatever he does, he is going to be successful. And so if I'm going to tell you that he's the suffering servant, he's going to be a successful suffering servant. He's successful in all that he does. You start in verse 13. It says, see my servant will be successful. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man, and his form did not resemble a human being, so he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him, for they will see what had not been told them, and they will understand what they had not heard. What we see right off the bat is that this servant doesn't sound successful. It kind of just sounds like abuse. As you look at what he's going through, that he was appalled, his appearance was so disfigured, he didn't even look like a man. It sounds like abuse, but Jesus the Messiah will fulfill all the rules of prophet, priest, and king, and he will dust off his hands, return to heaven, and he will kind of say, did it. Ta-da, I'm finished. I've done everything that I was supposed to do. In the heart of it, it's not going to look like that at all, but what we have to understand from the get-go is the Messiah, Jesus, will be successful. And you see that as a servant, as the suffering servant, he's not drawing a crowd. I mean, this type of person that we see in these verses is not somebody that somebody's coming to and saying, man, I really need to be around this person. This person is drawing me and I love what he's doing. I mean, you think about a servant and how many people have paid to go see your mom wash dishes? How many people have paid to see your dad go work on the car? There's not that interest that is there. And a suffering servant doesn't draw that type of, of a crowd. But for some of us, as we look at Jesus, this is going to be kind of relatable, where we say, well, Jesus is, is this somebody I heard about in church. He's just somebody that I know he's part of Christianity or whatever. Like, he's not that relatable to me. He's not that engaging with me. And we have to understand, in Isaiah 53, 52, that's exactly what he's saying, is that Jesus is not somebody that, that initially we would look at and say, oh, oh we need that. We're, we're kind of blind to that. And many will avoid or miss the significance of Jesus. This servant, though, will sprinkle many nations. That's what it says in verse 15. He will sprinkle many nations. And that's back referencing into Leviticus and Exodus, where the priests would then sprinkle the blood onto the people, and he'd say, now you are forgiven, now you are cleansed. And as that reference is being made, the Messiah will also cleanse. And as he's cleansing, what we're going to see is that, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, Jesus' precious blood is then applied to us. And if he's applied to us, what we see is that people, as the blood is being applied to them, the king's mouths will be shut. What basically is being said is, is somebody is finally going to understand the significance. Even though everybody is going to dismiss Jesus for the most part, at some point, Jesus is going to be recognized as important, and then all of a sudden it's going to be this big case of, of foot and mouth syndrome. It says in verse 15 that the kings will not have anything to say. These people will not have anything to, to respond because all of a sudden they're going to understand, oh, Jesus was significant. Jesus did do something successfully. And we start off really by just the, the question of, is Jesus significant in your life? 
Have you trusted in him as your Savior? Because as he came, it wasn't something that, that we look at and say, wow, this is what I needed. But at some point in our life, we have to kind of grapple with that and understand, is Jesus just some guy, or is Jesus my Savior? And that's what we see at the very beginning of this, is that the Messiah will be successful. It's not going to look like it. People are going to say, who's this gross guy? I don't want to be part of it. But at some point, after Jesus sprinkles, after Jesus dies, he becomes significant. He becomes successful. And what I see in the rest of this, what we're going to look at, is a confrontational kind of conversation. If you've ever sat down, whether it's a coffee shop or in your home or, or, or with your family, and you had a conversation with somebody that's on an opposing side to you, what you're going to find is those conversations aren't fun, but they're necessary at times. And what we see at the very beginning of this is a conversation, really, between somebody who has recognized Jesus' significance, and they're talking to the person that hasn't recognized this, and the conversation is really just a, here's who Jesus is, and here's why you need to trust him. Here's why you need to understand how significant the suffering servant truly is. So Isaiah 53 is what we're going to be looking at today. Here's what we're going to see. This is the first part of this conversation is the Messiah was easily over. And then you've got this big gap where all of a sudden there, there's no king. And what it's saying here is that he grew up before him like a young plant and a root out of dry ground. That there was no king at that point. And so people are excited because, hey, here's the Messiah. Here's this new king that's going to come out in, in this dry, dry land. And he's planted in this situation where the royal Davidic line can now continue through the person of Jesus. Think of our house right now. Our house has a lot of plants in it. And some of them are, are dying. They're like wilting and, and going away. One. One. One is dying. One is dying. <laughs> but I like to imagine our house in a positive light. It's a hospital. It's a, a place where plants can, can recover and revive, and, and Emery is, is taking care of all of them, and, and they're coming back to life. And this is what we see about the Messiah, is that in this dry land where nothing is growing, there's no king. Israel is without a king at this point. All of a sudden... Jesus is planted, the Messiah is planted, and there's this new plant in this dry and, and weary land. But what's interesting about this is that the Messiah didn't have any filters on his life. The Messiah didn't come in like this thunderbolt and say, here I am. He came in, according to Isaiah 53, as somebody who was unimpressive, that nobody would want to have anything to do with. And it's opposite of our culture, because our culture says... Put filters on your life. When, when you take a picture of your food, make it all pretty. When you take a picture of you, make yourself all pretty. When you, when you do something, make sure that people only see what you want them to see. For example, uh, here's what we would want you to see about our baby if we put a filter on our baby. Go ahead and ensure that. There's, there's our beautiful baby with a filter. Because in our day and age, you can put a filter on any, if you didn't notice, her eyes do not look like that. But you can filter anything. And Jesus, as he came, could have come and said, hey, hey here, here I am. And he could have filtered and said, here's my perfect life. But Jesus didn't do that. Right? Jesus came without a filter. Go get it. 
but you need options. Go ahead and go back to, to verse 3. It says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering. There is a, a, a person of the Messiah who was not this conquering king. He came as a suffering servant. Look at your Bible. Look at the, the Bible translation that you have. And look at verse 3 with me. How does the Bible describe the Messiah in verse 3? He was a, I mean, he wasn't welcome. People were fearful of him, and he didn't look like a king, so they shunned him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else? What else do you guys see in verse three? And that he was acquainted with deepest grief. Yeah. Man of sorrows. Man of sorrows. Mm-hmm. Rejected. Rejected. He was despised and. Despised and abandoned. And we didn't esteem him. We didn't esteem him. Yeah. I mean that that phrase new sickness, that new he that he was acquainted with sickness. It's kind of this idea that he was a friend of being sick, like a friend of, of being in that type of a situation. That he, he spent time in that. You look at what else it says. People turned away from. Him. Again, we put this filter on, on our lives a lot of times. Like, if you've ever created a Wii character or, like, an avatar for, like, your email account or whatever, like, you get to pick the picture that goes in that little circle. Like, you don't pick a, a picture that, like, is purposely ugly. And you think about Jesus and his coming. He could have come as anything or anyone, and he purposely went with the, the unflattering kind of view of himself. That was what he decided to do. He was despised. He was considered worthless. Yeah. My version says people turned away from him in disgust. Yes. Yeah. So you you look at this, and how easily was the Messiah overlooked? Really easily. It wasn't something that everybody was drawn to the pig pen type of a personality. It was a let's stay away from this guy. The Messiah was easily overlooked. And in this first part of this conversation in Isaiah 53, what you have to understand is the first thing to be communicated is don't overlook the Messiah. Like that's what the person, that's what the author, that's what the prophet is saying is is don't overlook the Messiah. Don't do it. Because in in the case of of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4, it's the same case here is that the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. There is an active blindness taking place back then and now where people see Christ for nothing. And they say, this is not important. And so in our conversations and in the conversation that's happening here, we have to understand the significance of the Messiah. second part of this conversation is that the Messiah came for a reason. In Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 6, it says, Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. If you guys have made a a resolution for 2022, I'm assuming that you guys have experienced some sort of feedback or some sort of resistance to that resolution so far. If you're still at it, good for you. Many people have given up uh, weeks or days ago. And it's very common for us when we hit that kind of resistance to say, hey, we're done. Unless you have a good motivation. Unless you have a really good reason for doing it, it kind of just falls by the wayside. And when I look at what Jesus was doing... You might ask, and I might ask, why would the Messiah come only to be overlooked? I mean, if you just take that first paragraph, and you say he was disgusting, he was despised, he was rejected, nobody wanted anything to do with him, then why did he come? He came for a reason, and it wasn't to just be accepted by people. He had a bigger and a a more clear purpose, because otherwise, like us, he'd say, well, failed, I'm done, I'm going to go back into heaven, I'm going to be done. Here's the reasons that he came. The first reason that it says in this paragraph is to lift up sin's consequences and to be struck down by God. To lift up sin's consequences and to be struck down 
by God. You think about the consequences of sin, and it was sicknesses and pain. Those things weren't there before the fall. And so when Jesus came as the Messiah, as it talks about in Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, he came and he performed miracles. And one of the things that he did in performing those 37 unique miracles that we talked about last week is just in the sense that he was showing, hey, I've got the power over all of sin uh, since consequences. I can control this. I can go above and beyond. And so he was able to do that. But I think about that, and, and humanity looked at him at the very end and said, yeah, you did all these performing the miracles, but you're hanging on a cross right now. Well, if you're, you're hanging on a cross, God must not love you. God must not have a plan for you. You're rejected by God even. And in Matthew 27, verse 43, it says that people said, he trusts in God, let God rescue him now. If he takes pleasure in him, for he said, I am the son of God. And we come back to Isaiah 53, and the purpose that he had was to bear or to show off, hey, I can lift up sin's consequences, but I also came to be struck down by God. And so as he's hanging on the cross, the only reason he continues to hang on the cross is because that's the reason that he came. It wasn't for people to say that you're successful or not. Because in my life, like I'm, I'm thinking and I'm saying, well, will people please with me? Are people impressed with me? Am I successful before people? And Jesus said, no, no, no. I came to be successful and to be struck down by God. Successful in God's eyes and be struck down by God. Which is an ironic thing because God planted that root only to strike that root down. The second thing that he did in this paragraph and, and the reason that he came is to take our punishment for our iniquity. To take our punishment for our iniquity. Our sicknesses and pain are downstream of the root problem, right? Any sickness that we have, any pain that we experience, it is not because of, of just life, it's because of the sin that is present in the world and present in our own life. And the root problem is we are sheep. <laughs> the root problem is, is we wander off and, and we are sheep. Sheep, by nature, are troublemakers. You think about any type of sheep, and it's not maybe purposely a troublemaker, but it's not going to stay where it's supposed to go. It's not supposed to go over here, but it will go over there. It's not supposed to chew or eat on that, but it's going to, right? Some of us have been around farms a little bit to know sheep are, are not the smartest animal in the bunch, and they are probably one of the only animals on planet Earth that do not have a defense mechanism. So not only are they going to get into trouble, but they're not going to be able to get themselves out of that trouble. <coughs> And that's exactly how we as humanity are compared to. And the Messiah's death would be to solve the root issue of my sin, of your sin. So that it's no longer a band-aid over the top, it's, it's taken care of. If you pay attention in our world, in our culture, in our news, what you'll wind up seeing is that people are saying, well, here's the bad guys, and here are the oppressed. And it's like, how bad are these bad guys, and how oppressed are these oppressed? Like, that's kind of how we view things. But in the middle, what's being missed is sin. Sin is being missed because sin is the root issue behind why they're doing this and why these people are being oppressed. Sin is, is what's driving all of this. And so the Messiah came to take out that root. We've been, we've been digging in our front yard and I've been joking with, we joked with Alex a little bit yesterday. There's these queen root packs of, of you know, you've got the queen bee and the queen ant. You've got crabgrass, and you've got these queen balls that are just everywhere. And as soon as you get one of those out, you're like, finally, that is not going to spread to any other part of my yard. That's what's the problem with sin, is that there's that queen, and sin needs to be dealt with. It's not just the sting, it's not just the pain, it's not just the sickness, the sin itself needs to be dealt with. And you look at the last verse in this paragraph, it clarifies all of this. Look at the last verse in verse, uh, verse 6. It says, The Lord has punished us for the iniquity of us all. Is that what it says? No. No. It should say that, right? Mm -hmm. It should be us being punished for the things that we deserve. But we don't have any business having peace with God, right? 
we don't have any business having this sort of peace that is talked about or this righteousness or forgiveness that is being given. But it says the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. In work environments, job projects, there are always the tasks that nobody wants to do. It's always that thing that's like, well, somebody else can do it, right? Somebody else can do it. And as you look at what the job description is for the Messiah, look at job, the job description that is talked about there in that paragraph. What's, what stands out to you? What is part of the job description that is referenced in those three verses? What did Jesus come to do? Faithful world. Faithful world. But, but specifically, as you look at those, what are the specific parts of that? Because I don't have time to go through all of these, so I need your help. <laughs> to take the punishment for the sins of us. That is what some sins say. Yeah. Yeah. They are pain. They are pain. Yeah. Take our punishment. Several times in the passage. For us, for all, for us, for all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Just think about the words that are, are used there. Struck down by God. He was pierced. He was crushed. He was punished. He was wounded. And like you said, because of my sin. Because of your sin. Because of our sin. He came for a reason. The Messiah didn't just show up one day and say... I'm ugly, I'm despised, I'm rejected. Well, this is, this is going to stink. He said, no, I came here for a purpose, and my purpose wasn't just to look good, it wasn't to smell good, it wasn't to act good, it was, it was for this. Our that, healing. What's that? Our healing. Our healing, yeah. Right. yeah. The Messiah had a job to do, no one wanted that job, but Jesus knew that it needed to be done. Isaiah wanted to come. That's the, the next part of this. Is the Messiah wanted to come. Isaiah 53, verse 7 through 9. Here's what it says. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before his shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment, and who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck down because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was ri- but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Duke University did a study that measured human patterns and habits, and what they discovered was probably about 40% of the average person's day is not spent making decisions, but it's just kind of out of habit. It's just... Here's the things that I normally do, so I'm just going to kind of go and, and go through the, the, the systems that I'm already having in place. And I look at that, and what the Messiah did was not just by habit. It was not an unintentional falling into. It was a, I'm intentionally, and I want to come. I want to do this. It wasn't, uh-oh, I, I, I guess I have this on my plate today, or I have to die. It's, it's, it's a surprise to me. No, the Messiah wanted to come. Jesus wanted to to do what he was doing. Think about it this way. If you were attacked by an animal, or by a thief, or by somebody that was going to overpower you, and you said, okay, I need to to take the form of an animal to defend myself, my family, my stuff, uh, what animal would you choose to defend yourself? This is kind of how my brain works, and so you're just going to go on this ride with me. A lion, okay. Was that? <laughs> yeah. 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 Honey badger. Yeah. Nice. Nice. A snake. Okay. Any other animals from from this side? A bear. A bear. Okay. Any kind? I can't think of much that could get around Yeah. Yeah. You can't see very far, but that's okay. You, you don't need to. You don't to run into stuff you don't like. Yeah. A kangaroo. Ooh, kickboxing kangaroo. Huh? A kickboxing kangaroo. That's right. Nice. Here's the, here's the animal, just by virtue of a vote, who would choose a sheep? No one? Anyone? A longhorn sheep. Maybe a longhorn sheep, right? Yeah, they've got something to defend themselves at least. You look at a lamb. And this is, and this is exactly what the Messiah decided to do. He said... Hey, I'm going to be attacked. I'm going to be pierced. I'm going to be punished. 
What am I going to take on the, the form of? I'm going to take on a baby sheep. That's how I'm going to defend myself. And you look at how it's described, and that's exactly what it says, is that like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before his shears, he did not open his mouth. And the Israelites, especially the Jewish people who are reading this, have seen sheep like every day of their life. Because every time they go to the temple, they see lamb after lamb after lamb led up, led up, led up to the temple. And you see them slaughtered over and over and over again. And that's just kind of how it worked. No sheep would go up to the temple and think, all right, I've got to plead my case. No sheep would say, hey, I've got to figure out how to get out of this situation. And no sheep would say, hey, here's how I'm going to defend myself. And I'm not, like you've probably seen the movie Chicken Run. And you see all these like plans and plotting of the chickens trying not to get slaughtered. That's not how a lamb thinks. A lamb doesn't plot and, and defend and, and try to fight for itself. A lamb would just be like, here's where I'm going. Uh, and now I'm dead. <laughs> right. Well, I was just kind of thinking that yeah. when you're saying that, I feel like you said sheep have no like defense mechanism. Yeah. But what they've always had, even back then, is their shepherd. Hmm. And that is their defense mechanism. So if we're like sheep, our shepherd, which is Christ, is yeah. our defense mechanism yeah. against the world. Yeah. We may stray, but we tend to still follow. Even if you have like a straggler, you're still end up following the shepherd. And he controls these like masses of sheep. So. Right. Right. Yeah, and so you take that idea and then you kind of snowball it on top of it and you say, okay, if the Messiah, if Jesus is the, the lamb now right. and, and God is his shepherd, God is leading him to be slaughtered. And Jesus trusts the shepherd. Jesus trusts the Father's plan. And so Jesus, as the Messiah, he's taken up to be slaughtered. And Jesus, before his accusers, said nothing by way of defense. He could have... Could have called down angels. He could have done something, but he did absolutely nothing. You see, even in those accounts, Jesus barely even talked. Like He, he didn't say much of anything unless he was asked a, a very direct question. I just encourage you to think about that. If we are, kind of what you just mentioned, like if we are now the sheep following Christ, in some ways we should say, okay, how much am I so concerned about defending myself? Or am I just following Christ as much? Am I trusting the shepherd, or am I trying to defend myself? Now, just as a, a side note, uh, you should do a study through the Bible on lawsuits. It's really interesting because our, our our happy lawsuit culture that kind of that we have, uh, there's a lot in the Bible about lawsuits. And I just want to put this out here, write, write this down, or read this later. First Peter chapter two, verse eighteen through twenty-five. First Peter two, eighteen through twenty-five. I would encourage you, just do a study on lawsuits in the Bible. There's a lot, a lot of content about defending yourself and, and about how to do or how not to do that. First Peter 2, 18 to 25. Anyways, that's, that's off on, on another tangent. But sheep don't defend themselves. The Messiah didn't defend himself. Another part of this is that sheep don't care what others think. They don't care what other people think. The generation and posterity that it references there in Isaiah 53 around him weren't considered with the significance of what Jesus was doing. They didn't really care. They saw Jesus and they're like, well, another guy is going to die. Another another person gone. He wasn't caring. Jesus wasn't caring about his popularity. He cared about doing the job that God had in front of him. And the people around them made the assumption that Jesus was an evil person. This this thing like just gets stuck in my mind a lot is that the, all the people that saw Jesus go and he died on the cross, everybody and said, man, he must have done something wrong. He's dying with criminals, so he must be a criminal. He's, he's suffering a, a torturous death. He must have deserved it. And then on top of that, you have the religious leaders who had probably the greatest influence around the people. If you've got an influencer of the day, it's the religious leaders. And they're saying, this guy's the worst. Don't listen to him. And then the people with the most authority, the people that can filter out and, and, and change the narrative however they want it to be, the Romans, they were the ones that were killing it. And so everything in Jesus' path, at this point as he's dying, everybody's looking at him and saying, he failed, he's a loser, he should be being killed, he's not successful. And Jesus, in this situation, didn't care what other people thought. That's amazing. That's amazing because... If I'm in his situation, I would be like, 
guys, I'm doing this for a reason. I want to have the last word of some kind. You know, like, I want to make an argument for why this is important. But Jesus said, I mean, the last thing he said, right, was, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit, and he died. He simply said, I'm doing this for you. I'm not going to defend myself. I know that you know. And then he died. And the last part of this is the Messiah was successful. As this suffering servant, the Messiah was successful. And he was successful because it says in verse 10, yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make your guilt, when you make him a guilt offering, you will see his, his seed, he will prolong his days, and by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. By Jesus doing this, in the way that he did this, in the perfect way that he did this, he was successful because the Lord, who put him in that situation, was pleased with it. You look at the, the Bible, and there's, there's people that brought sacrifices and said, here's what you need to sacrifice, and, and God said, no, I, I'm not pleased with that. But with Jesus, the Lord was pleased. Out of all the Messiah's roles, all of his names, all of his jobs, the only thing that we see here out of this kind of point in, in Scripture is that Yahweh, the Lord, is pleased with him as the suffering servant. Yes, he's the king. Yes, he's the prophet. Yes, he's the priest. But he is the suffering servant that God is pleased with. And the reason that he was pleased with it is that God is holy. God is, is, is holy in everything that is said, done, thought, any motivation that is wrong. God has every, every argument and every right to punish that person, to punish that. Because he needs to set things right. In his holiness, he's perfect, and he needs to set everything right. There can't be any loose ends when it comes to sin. It has to be judged. And Jesus takes the place of that guilt offering. Instead of us being punished, Jesus is punished for us. Jesus takes the place of you and me. And the Lord turns his judgment from humanity onto his servant Messiah. And pours out every drop of punishment onto him. There's nothing left. There's no little bit where it's like, eh, I can give this to you over here. Oh, you did something really bad? No, it's all been placed upon Jesus. There's no more judgment for you and for me for sin. The Bible, in fact, says the only thing that separates us from God now is our unbelief. Is that we have to trust Jesus to save us. Amen. And so you look at verse 11 and what it says is, After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied by his knowledge and righteous and my righteous servant will justify many and he will carry their iniquities and I love this the Messiah is satisfied the Lord is pleased but the Messiah is satisfied how does a slaughtered lamb have satisfaction we well, see in this verse after his anguish he will see light and be satisfied and I think that there are three reasons that we can give why the Messiah would be satisfied the first reason is this he fulfilled the Lord's plan the Lord had a plan. He fulfilled it. The Lord is pleased. The Messiah can kind of put his feet up and say, I did my job. I'm done. Second part of that is the Messiah justified many and took humanity's iniquities. He wanted to come. He wanted to come for you and for you and for you and for you and for me. And he did that and he took our iniquities and it's been complete. It's been finished. And he can look at that and say, not only have I done a job well done, but I've saved you. And I love you taking your sin, there's no longer anything left for you. And he's satisfied in that. And then, just like in a simple no doubt kind of a thing, he will see light and be satisfied. The Messiah can be satisfied because he's alive. Ding, 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 ding. He's alive. Like, the Messiah couldn't be satisfied if he was just laying in the ground, rotting away, and being like, well, I did it, and I'm dead. Like, it, it's the fact that he sees light and he's alive. My righteous servant will justify many, he will carry their iniquities, but he doesn't stay dead. He comes back to life. And right now, Jesus the Messiah is sitting at the right hand of God. He's sitting at the right hand of God. He isn't pacing. He isn't wringing his hands. He's not worried. He's, he's not like, what's going to happen next? He's reigning. He's on his throne, reigning with his feet up. He's content. 
And the hardest thing, think about this with me, this is kind of one of my favorite parts of this week. The hardest thing that Jesus could possibly be doing now is he's kind of just sitting there on his throne. It says in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, is that he is advocating for us. He's a go-between for us. So that when Satan comes to Annie, or he comes to me, or comes to Jeff, or he comes to one of us and says, Matt, you are an idiot. You messed up again. You've sinned again. You should never love him ever again. When Satan says that about me, the hardest thing that Jesus has to do at this point, sitting on his throne, and this is me interpreting a little bit, Jesus sitting on his throne, kind of looks at the Father, shows him his wrist, scarred, I've paid for that, sets it back down. That's it. Because the suffering servant, the Messiah, has taken all of the sin... And his advocacy has already been taking place because he's already accomplished all the work that needs to be done. And so you and I are just sitting here as a recipient of what Jesus has already accomplished 2,000 years ago. And the epilogue of this entire chapter is in verse 12. It says, Therefore I will give him the many as a portion. He will receive the mighty as spoiled because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Really, what this is is just like here's the end of the conversation regarding the Messiah, the suffering servant. It acts as a bridge for us, is that the Lord accepts Jesus the Messiah and he will give him the spoils. This is the entire scope of eternity. That's why Jesus is at the center of all of this, is because Jesus has accomplished everything to fix all that's in the past. He's fixed everything that's accomplished all in the future. And so now Jesus is the center pin for you and for me, for people back there, for people in the future. Everyone comes back to Jesus, and we have to realize that as the suffering servant, he was the only one that could justify, that could take away sin, that could forgive, and all of a sudden, in some way, take the goodness that was back in creation, bring it and fast forward it to now, and give us hope for the future. And the big word of this all boils down into land is that the Messiah, yes, he's the prophet, yes, he's the priest, yes, he's the king, but he is the lamb. John 1, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And we get to sit here and we look back and we say, That is where our faith is dependent on. It's not how great I am. It's not how, how faithful you've been or how faithful you haven't been. It is I'm depending on the person of Jesus who has already done the work for me. Here's the two applications, and then we're done. For personal help, Jesus loves you and heals you. The guilt you hold on to, the name that you have been called or that you call yourself, the regret that you live with. We let that be the lens that we live our lives by, right? And somehow, when we look at this, we have to understand that we take Jesus' love, his care for us, and we flip it around and say, yes, these things have happened. But Jesus' love is what I'm identified with and as. And Jesus is healing in my life. It's not complete yet, because I'm still hurting. But it's what sustains me, strengthens me, and that one day it will be complete. And so for me and for you, we have to understand Jesus loves me, heals me, and if I go anywhere else for healing, anywhere else for love, anywhere else for support, what I'm going to find is that it is a broken love, and it is a temporary healing. the church on a mission is that we need to know how to share the gospel from the Old Testament. Man, if you look at Isaiah 53 and you don't see the gospel there, we're missing something. And there are many people that I've met that don't read the Bible at all, but then there are people that are Jewish and they look at the Bible and they say the New Testament is, is not even part of the Bible. And we have to understand just from their perspective, hey, how can we share the gospel with them if, if we can't use this third of our Bible. But on a second note, for you and for me, as we're reading the Bible, we should be able to understand, hey, these picture frames up here that represent the Old Testament, 
they're not just up there for the fun of it. The Old Testament isn't just there for the, the kicks and giggles and interesting stories. The Old Testament is there because it is the exact same message mirrored that we're going to see going into the New Testament. And if you can't see the gospel in the first two-thirds of the Bible, you're going to have a very skewed version of the gospel going forward. And you're going to miss a lot of the depth and a lot of the, the, the preciousness. And you, I think, honestly, you're going to not have that personal health that we just talked about. You're going to miss out on the personal health that, you, that we need if we don't see the gospel clearly in the New Testament. All that to say, praise God, right? Amen. Praise Jesus for Jesus, and that he is the Lamb of God. He's taken away our sins.